A man's work is nothing but this slow trek to rediscover, through the detours of art, those two or three great and simple images in whose presence his heart first opened. Albert Camus, philosopher, author, and journalist. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. George Van Hook is a painter adept in both oil and watercolor. What he paints is a visual response to the subject before him, whether it's the landscape, a figure, or still life. The rich textures, harmonious colors, and design of Van Hook's paintings are the ultimate expression of two converging forces, the external beauty of the world around him and his deep, internal emotional response to what he sees. George Van Hook lives in Cambridge, New York, a beautiful 19th century village in the Hudson Valley. His artistic journey began early in his life and like Mr. Toad's wild ride, it took him through many formative experiences and places that influenced him to become the fine art artist he is today. In high school, he traveled throughout France and England working as a filmmaker, and that experience exposed him to the wealth of museums in Europe and their priceless treasures of fine art. Seeing firsthand the breathtaking art in these museums nurtured within him a deep interest not only in art history, but also in becoming a professional artist. In this exuberant conversation, George Van Hook shares his fascinating take on art history his philosophy of creating fine art, the rewards of working closely with artist friends who are dear to him, and the meaning of truth and honesty in art. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. George Van Hook, you live in Cambridge... New York, We're in Cambridge, right? New York, upstate New York, kind of midway between uh, Bennington and Saratoga Springs, Bennington, Vermont. We're a couple of miles, probably two miles from the uh, Vermont border. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of the little factoids about Cambridge, a couple of, but Norman Rockwell lived right up the road in West Arlington. One of uh, our favorite paintings that he did is of the little girl with the black eye and the pigtail sitting in front of the principal's office. Yes, I remember that one. And that was actually painted at our small at our small uh, central school here. We have a, you know, there's 1,200 people in town, so we have a wonderful little central school. We have three daughters, two of which were redheads, so uh, when the eldest was, uh, oh, probably about seven or eight years old, the school dressed her up in pigtails and, and, and put on a black eye and took photographs of her sitting in the bench in front of the principal's office. The school did a recreation of it because, you know, that's exactly where he painted the picture. So uh, he painted it probably, what, 60, 70 years ago. When they finally remodeled the school, uh, within the last decade, they actually um, took down the door with the principal, you know, the, the lettering on it, and uh, a few of the other parts of that office, and have uh, put them on display in a glass uh, display case in the school, so that you know, with a with a copy of the painting and everything like that. So uh, it's still, it's just, you know, anyway, it's a charming charming area. We uh, love it here. Is that like in the the Hudson River Valley area as well? It would be the upper end of the Hudson Valley. The uh, Berkshires are also right below us. And uh, uh, to the north are the Adirondacks. And to the immediate east are the Green Mountains of Vermont. In fact, I would say that if um, geography were determined by geology, then clearly uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut would have gone a little bit further west to the Hudson River. But the the geography of that, the state lines were drawn in the 18th century when, particularly in New York and the Hudson River, uh, Governor then, uh, Robert Livingston, lived on the, uh, the east side of the Hudson. And so he was darn sure that we have this little swath of uh, about 20 miles lo- wide and uh, going from New York City all the way to Montreal of New York State that is literally the, the, the land that time forgot because all of New York State's infrastructure is on the west side of the river. And of course, Vermont 
is you know to the east of us here, and so from you can drive uh, three and a half hours down to New York City on Route 22, which is a little two-lane blacktop, and you can take it and drive all the way to Montreal, and that is the little narrow strip of land that we live in. So it is really, truly, uh, still a 19th century, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, landscape here, almost entirely untouched by anything more modern than. Uh, you know, a two-lane road. So yeah. we love it. Yeah, yeah. it's really quite <laughs> remarkable. It, it's, yeah. it's beautiful country. My wife and I took a road trip. We had not driven through the New England states. We've driven, we have ah. been in every state of the United States except the New England states, which was yes. a sad oversight. And so yes. we started on 22 at the southern end oh. of New York. Now we Lovely. cut over, yeah, we cut over into Vermont and then went up to Montreal. It was beautiful country. It was absolutely it, it, beautiful. It's magnificent landscape. Yes, yes. And so uh, we uh, we lived out west. I mean, we're Susie and I are both from Philadelphia area. Uh, we lived out west for 12 years uh, in Northern California, but we decided once we started our family, we wanted to return sort of to an area that we were familiar with. And uh, this is very much like, well, to be perfectly honest, my, my mother's a Livingston, and so that's why we know the Livingston story. Uh, Robert Livingston is one of her ancestors. And, really? um wow. Yes, yes. And, he, you know, he, uh, and his brother was the first, he was the first uh, governor of uh, New York State, and his brother was the first governor of uh, New Jersey. And uh, his brother actually uh, helped uh, was the one who actually helped uh, Jefferson write the uh, Declaration of Independence. Regardless, it, we had a, a beautiful farm in Bucks County growing up. This, and I'm sure that was an extro- extremely strong influence on my landscape aesthetic. Um, you know, the Pennsylvania Impressionists were, were they lived right nearby. And Arthur Meltzer, uh, in, when we were in Abington, he lived about a mile down the street. And this landscape in, in this current era reminds me very much of what that was like when I was growing up in the 60s. And so I'm sure that uh, was a, a significant draw for us to return here. You know, that, that suburban Philadelphia area now looks you know, pretty much like suburban Atlanta, like suburban Detroit. But this area is still remarkably consistent with the way it looked 50, 60, 70 years ago. You know, in fact, I I tell the story, you know, we've lived here for, I think, 31 years. And in the uh, time that we've lived here until very recently, there's only been one house built in town. And that was built by an 84-year-old doctor who sold his uh, 1850 federal house (laughs) to a a very dear friend of ours. And uh, he moved about a quarter mile up the street and built a new house and promptly died. So, uh, we oh boy, people, how did that you, work you, out? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I said, you can come here, you can build a house, but you won't be around very long. So, uh, you know, it's uh, and there's um, you know, there's there's two Revolutionary War uh, cemeteries right here in town, and you know, the the Battle of Saratoga, which really was the turning point of the American Revolution as far as the Northeast. I mean, it sort of started in the Northeast, and you know, the, the Battle of Saratoga Saratoga in the Battle of Bankton, the, the, the soldiers literally walked right through Cambridge. Several of the skirmishes uh, actually literally took place right in the village. And so, uh, uh, you know, that, that sense of history still pervades almost everything in this area. And so, uh, you know, that, that's another very fulfilling aspect um, to living here. You feel that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a continuity. You know, I like that. Definitely. You know? Well, it's also yeah. the home. Now, most of us who, who uh, we think of the Hudson River School, you know, yes. with the sublime... <laughs> magnificent paintings that just, yeah, yeah, it's, they're, they're beautiful. You know, people always say the Hudson River, what they're thinking, what, what, what is the question here is yeah. that that is not a question of uh, painting. That's more a question of philosophy, mm. also of technical abilities. The Hudson River School, as we know it, Kensett and all of those, uh, that took place prior to uh, Impressionism really on the rise. That really was a, a Civil War era uh, and slightly after. And of course, America was very conservative in its aesthetics up until Americans began going to Europe and uh, learning about the Impressionist style and coming back. And so really, th- that, that work is closer to Emerson, say, than to Edwardian or to, to, to a later 
uh, more universal. You know, Impressionism became quite universal by, you know, the, the 1890s. You know, you, you found it, it, at least within the Western culture, you found it, you know, in Czechoslovakia, you found it in Russia, you found it, and then you found it, it came to America. And so when people talk about, oh, the Hudson River School, they're really talking about a pre-impressionistic uh, approach to landscape combined with that Emerson Thoreau sense of the sublime that the American wilderness and the philosophers sort of combined. And so it's not so much a painterly uh, approach to the visual world as it is an interpretation of an internal philosophy. So, so that, that's one thing. A, a closer association to contemporary Hudson River School, quote unquote, painting would be, for example, the Woodstock School of Carlson, John Carlson, or one of my favorite painters, Chauncey Ryder, who did many of his paintings uh, down there around Ancramdale and things like that, which is just uh, you know a couple hours south of here. That really would be a late 19th, early 20th century Hudson River School. But by that point, it was subsumed into, for example, the Boston School, or very quickly, you know, the, the eight out of New York, or even the Pennsylvania Impressionists. That, that's the thing. People who aren't familiar with the timeline conflate the Hudson School with, you know, the other American Impressionist schools. And it really was an entire generation earlier. And so, you know, that, that's the only thing that, that, you know, you sort of have to go around and explain to people. That's a good distinction. It certainly was during, uh, pr- prior to the, to the Impressionist. But why, why do you think the Impressionism, it really appealed to the to people, it, it, there was something about it. Oh yes, anyway, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't until you know Americans. I mean, as, as a you know a, a chase. Okay, I mean this is a whole art history thing, and, and you know I, I'm. I, I read a lot of art history, and I almost was an art historian as opposed to a painter, but this is an art history thing. You had when Americans wanted to go to Europe, and again, I grew up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the sister city to Paris. In 1876, you know, on the centennial, uh, France actually gave uh, Philadelphia a full-scale model of the Statue of Liberty. At much of Philadelphia, you know, the Philadelphia, those great boulevards that right out the Philadelphia Museum of Art and things like that, those are based architecturally on Paris as it was redesigned under Napoleon by Baron Hausmann. It was Hausmann that put in all those great boulevards in Paris that we think are so wonderful now. Now, the reason Napoleon had him tear down the old Middle Age, you know, the, the, the 15th, 16th century communities and put those in was literally so that his cavalry could get around Paris faster and quell any insurrection. That is also, I mean, that's a reason, I hate to say it, but that's the reason in part why Washington, D.C. is based on that same sort of pattern. And you'll notice in Washington, D.C., there are very few windows in the central uh, organized, you know, the governmental part, very few windows on the first floor. That, that's an aside, but... But it's very um, practical, <laughs> considering exactly. the threats. Yeah. In other words, it, it was very, you know, you know, Paris was made so that the cavalry could get around. But in the 1870s, you know, uh, you know, impression was already sort of formulating there, but it was the Americans. So the Americans in in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a much more sophisticated city than Manhattan in uh, the the 19th century. With the the you know Boston was considered the Athens of America, and Philadelphia was considered you know the the most advanced city. It wasn't until really uh, after the Second World War that New York took total predominance. What you had was artists from the Americas, particularly the Mid Atlantic states and New York, wanting to go to Europe to study because you know that was. Where where you, you know you studied at that point, you studied with Jerome. You studied at the Cold of Beaux Arts, and you learned a very classical training. They didn't go there to study Impressionism. It was it was that once they got there, and they many of them, for example, from Philadelphia, were studying in the studios of Cabanal and things. Once they got there, and they went out to St. Ives, or they went out to Fontainebleau, and they saw the French artists uh, painting en plein air, as they actually do say in France, uh, and painting outside. Then they got turned on by that. They didn't go there to study Impressionism. It wasn't until they got there. You know, you think of Theodore Robinson going out and painting with Monet and Givernet. It wasn't until they got there that they recognized that, oh my goodness, what a liberating influence. The other thing is, then you had, so you had the Philadelphia... New York people essentially going to Paris. And then the other great 
uh, uh, concentration of, of sort of art there was sort of in the, the, in the um, middle of the country, you know, or what was the, considered the middle, but the German immigrants of Ohio and, and that area, so they all wanted to go to Germany, not to France. Uh, and you have, you know, William Merritt Chase and that whole group, you know, Chase saying, oh, I'd rather go to Paris than, I, you know, than to heaven. You know, they, the, the business people there got together and, and they're the ones who paid for him to go over. But many of them went to Germany. And in Germany, you had the choice, you know, Paris was based on drawing. And then they went out and they met the Impressionists. German had sort of two schools. One was the Dusseldorf school, which was predicated very strongly on drawing the Florentine style. They came out of Florence. Of course, that's discrepancy. You know, you, you had Florence and Venice all the way back into the 16th century, sort of, is it line or is it color? Is it line? And so many of the Germans went to Munich and many of them went to Dusseldorf. And that's why you had two distinct schools of German painting. The, the Munich painters were a very broad brush, very, you know, much darker. And the um, Dusseldorf school was much more like the pre-Raphaelites, you know, a very fine drawing line. And so all of that came back to America and, uh, you know, caught on like wildfire. And, and that's why you had the rise of uh, the, the fantastic American Impressionists. Yeah, I just, I just read a book by, um, oh, I can't remember her name. She's the mother of the Cohen brothers of, oh, brother, where art thou? <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, you know, the the... What is what's that latest one they did the Legend of Buster Scruggs? I know, Scruggs. I know. They, yeah, they she, just, so she yeah. was an art historian. I didn't, you know, I didn't know this, yes. but she wrote this book yes. on Edgar Payne, and that's one of the things uh, she writes about is his, both him and his wife Elsie, how they were influenced heavily by the European impressionists and and adopted that. Uh, they they spent time there, uh, fascinated yes. with that. Yes. You know, the other book that's fun is David McCullough's book. You know, he wrote the wonderful biographies of, of you know, so many historical biographies. Yeah. But, you know, he is, um, uh, what's his name, Tim Larson's father-in-law. Tim, Tim Larson is married to his daughter. And uh, he actually uh, has a place in Maine that, that we, 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 we know quite well. And his book about, the, 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 I think it's because of his, is becoming familiar with Lawson and his painting. He wrote that wonderful book I said, the, about all the people going to Europe in the 19th century. And that's a very readable, I can't remember the title. So I just looked it up on Amazon. It's, it's The Greater Journey, Americans in Paris by David McCulloch. That's right. David uh, McCulloch lives just outside of uh, Camden, Maine and has a farm there and friends of ours take his hay. And- oh, man. I got to check him out. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Boy. But anyway. Yeah. But <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was, art, hist- get a that was art history in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. Like presto art history. I know. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? historical influences and we can see how one one school of thought leads to another leads to another and and i think that's that's the the wonder of humanity right and the development of the yeah. arts yeah but you yeah I look at your art this is these are my feelings whether they're the ones that you you intended or not i i hope they don't yeah. i hope they do not offend you <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so this is what I see. I see. I I, I feel a sense of nostalgia in some cases. Uh, I I sense. Um, I see what to me are like relics of my childhood. Whether it's uh you know like a rural scene. Uh, one of your paintings, you've got a toy car, a '57 Chevy, which was our family oh. car. <laughs> yes, those are very specific yeah. to us. Yes, but, yeah. But that, I mean, in that instance, um, well, God, okay, our, our, th- those have to do with our kids growing oh, up, wow. and uh, okay. I actually I mean that specifically. That was uh, I had. We had three small kids. My my wife had breast cancer and was very very ill, oh. and uh, so I put a tremendous amount of energy into, uh, so we built model cars with my kids and we, we designed the paintings and that was all done to give the kids kind of a relief from, you know, the kids were, you know, seven, 
10 years old. And so uh, that series of the cars and all that stuff comes specifically from when the kids were little and, and mom was really ill. So uh, oh, wow. uh, that's what they come from there now. I mean, I've got one hanging on my wall. It's, it's probably, well, it's over 20 years old because she's been, she's been well for over 20 years. But uh, well, that's, good. that's what that, those paintings come from. Well, see, yeah. there's always, a, there's, a, there's my story <laughs> as a viewer yeah. and there's yeah. your story as an yeah. artist, right? See, I would have never yeah. known that had I, yeah. had I not expressed it, but it touched me. In, in, yes. <laughs> yes. And in fact, the, the biggest one, I mean, oh, the, you know, kids are so wonderful. And uh, little Isabel was, I think she was seven. And she was a huge Calvin and Hobbes fan. Uh, the last big one, it's, it's seven paintings that are all in, in, in a series that are combined. And uh, the, the, the ultimate one of them is because uh, we brought in, then we brought in the dinosaurs because Calvin and Hobbes have dinosaurs. Right, and we brought in yeah. the airplanes and they got airplanes in them. And the final one goes to this great big super spectacular uh, where there's dinosaurs and airplanes and 57 Chevy and all that stuff. And the, the title is When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, a studio opera. And Izzy and I, you know, she's seven years old. We wrote an opera together. <laughs> 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 and we did this, I, you know, it was just, it was just a pure escapism. Um, but it was, and I still have that painting hanging on my wall and, uh, oh, you know, wow. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good yeah. title. I like that. Yes, it was. It was. It was. Uh, uh, if you, I could send you a picture. Of, I would I'll like send to you a see photo it. Of yeah. Painting. You know, so sometimes life is, uh, life is, can be pretty tough and, uh, yeah. you know, you just, you know, you, you buckle down and get through her however you can, you know, it's, uh, but uh, Susie's doing, you know, she's, she's, yeah, she's great. She's an amazing woman. Uh, she, she taught at Skidmore. She had a, several fantastic careers, but she's a mycologist. A mycologist. What is that? Uh, mushrooms. Mushrooms. Oh, okay. She's uh, yeah. one of the yeah. best mycologists in the country. And uh, she uh, was in, uh, she, she worked, had a first career with, with the Nature Conservancy um, and then with Maine Coast Heritage Trust, you know, in land conservation. And then she spent 18 years teaching at Skidmore College. And then uh, she helped start a company that, is growing mycelium up. It's called the Ecovate of mycelium up or an organic substrate to replace all styrofoam. Uh, she worked there 10 years and then she just came home one day and said, I don't want to work anymore. I'm done. <laughs> and she retired. So, which is fair. Perfectly fair. Yeah, I get and, it. Yeah. Uh, uh, now she's never been so busy in her life. So, uh, you know, she's writing books and, um, oh, good. you know, very yeah. involved with sort of political issues and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I am thoroughly convinced that humans are project oriented, not career oriented. I, yes. Yeah. Very. Yes. 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 What do I want to work on now? Yeah, yes. exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I have so many interests and there's, there's no possibility of doing it in uh, a limited lifetime. No. So. No, there isn't. There, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes. Yes. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, the end is in sight. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <Better> buckle down. <laughs> well, I don't mean to get... That's okay. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I have no problem with that. Yeah. yeah. The trip is still worth the ticket. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who wouldn't yeah. want anything else, you know? So Exactly. But yeah. on, a yeah. lighter, on a lighter note... Yes. Uh, yes. You, 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 when you mentioned the dinosaur title, you know, and I'm thinking, and you mentioned the 57 Chevy. See, that's what I, as a kid, even back then, those cars were considered dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, yes. Isn't that interesting? Yes. I mean, yeah. Well, even when we were kids, it was like, whoa, those things are, yes. And yet, you know, you look at, you know, a ten, even a 10-year-old car now and, you know, a 10-year-old Honda Civic, you know, the guy says, oh, I got 150,000 miles on it. I'll keep it for another 10 years. You know, <laughs> I guess I think they make cars better oh, now. Oh, they do. <laughs> well, see, that's yeah. the thing. I, I have these friends that say, oh, yeah, I would love to have a 57 Chevy. Now, here's what goes through my mind when they say that. I mean, yeah. the 57 Chevy looks great on the outside, but it was a horrible yeah. car. My family yeah. car, everywhere we went, we'd break down. We'd try to go on a family <laughs> vacation. We'd be broke down. Or he'd be pulled over by the police because the taillight was out or some other thing. Exactly. Or because the struts oh, yeah. are out and the thing There's is weaving all over. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we actually had a 53 Plymouth Cranbrook, um, oh, yeah. you know, that we came from California and that we, you know, I rebuilt the motor and repainted everything and like that and brought it back here and I thought, boy, I'll keep this forever. And then I said, you know what? <laughs> no way. I'm selling this. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because it just, you know, it's so nice to be able to get in the car and turn the key and go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. it. See, to me, cars have always yeah. been point A to point B. 
So, Point A right. to point B and make sure they carry the painting gear. That's it. Exactly. You got to have the painting gear in there. Yeah. yeah. Big enough for the easel and then let's go. So, yeah. so, so another quality yeah. of your paintings that, that drew, draw me in is when I go in. Of course, I've never seen your paintings yeah. in real life, which I thoroughly regret. Yeah. So I see yeah. photos. So, I, you know, I have to judge based on that. I'm sure it's even more intense and better. There's a lot of surface and a yeah. lot of, yeah, yeah, a lot of surface. But what I see yeah. is these luxurious textures of paint. It's it's like you've taken this 2D yeah. surface and turned it into a 3D sculpture. The paint itself is almost like the subject of the painting itself, too. Yes, very much so. Uh, I, 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 I sort of say the thing, you know, let the paint do the work. Yeah. You know, and, and this goes back, you know, I knew that you did that wonderful interview with Jimmy, and, I, you know, mm -hmm. you know Jimmy and I go way back. And, um, you know, when we first were out painting on the street and we would literally paint, you know, two or three 24 thirties a day of street scenes. And whoa, things. whoa, whoa, two and, or three um, 20 by thirties. Yes. Yes. We were nuts. Yes. But we bought our paint in cans. We bought that classic oil in cans and we used big brushes and, um, you know, we, yeah, we would paint two or three big paintings a day. It was just, you know, we were 20 years old. It was just, we knew you had to cover X amount of yardage with, you know, you just had to paint a thousand paintings, you know, to get a handle on it. Then I know both Jim and I, we sort of went back to, a, we went to a slightly more, well, much more refined and sort of finished. And now both of us, we talk about this, uh, I've gone back to where they're not as, as loose as they were, you know, 40 years ago, but I still, I, I very much want the paint to do the work as I, as I say it. I don't, you know, delineate with, I rather, you know, paint with a full brush and, and try to have the paint and the paint, you know, who was it? You know, the Keats poem, the dancer and the dance, uh, you know, the paint and the painting, I, I try to have them sort of be one and the same, you know, the interchange between the two of them, whether you're looking at the painting. I mean, I'm sitting in the studio right now and I'm looking at a couple of paintings that are 20 feet across the room, or I were to go up and, you know, as I love to do and look at my paintings, you know, from, you know, a foot away and see, you know, what's the paint doing? Yes. It, it, it's both of them. I, I sometimes wonder if I imagine we, we look at paintings a little differently than someone who is not a painter. <laughs> Completely differently, not even somewhat differently. Right. I, I the more the older I get, completely differently, completely differently. And you realize you only realize that you know most people are looking at at best they're looking at a picture. Artists look at paintings, and that is there's a world of difference between the two. And and it's it's actually it's created a lot. Of, you know I think from a commercial standpoint it creates a lot of problems. In other words, I think galleries. Many, many galleries, if they're dealing with representational work, they are trying to sell a picture and they don't understand that they have to get their clients to, 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 to move to buying a painting because a painting is completely different than a picture. You know, and I think that's another reason why the Giclée market has come in and stuff like that because, you know, I have a lot of galleries that say, well, you know, well, you know, our clients are, are very happy to put up a couple of, you know, the difference is, is, astronomical it's otherworldly it, it's it's like you know greek and chinese um yeah it's, it's a huge difference and you know and one other thing you know just in terms of nostalgia one of the reasons we lived there again we, we had a you know an 18th century farm in bucks county growing up and uh, you know i grew up around you know sort of i mean i grew up both in in you know a suburban environment and in a rural environment and i was very used to that concept of, of rural manual labor one of the things, you know, Washington County is still one of the primary agricultural counties in uh, New York. And, of course, we're right next to Vermont, and Vermont still actively promotes its working farm lifestyle landscape. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the things that drew me here. When I'm painting, for example, my rural landscapes here, in no way do I think of them as nostalgic, I think of them as literally right now today, this is what's in front of me, and also even as a lifestyle, for want of a better word, that in a world where so many lives are utterly meaningless, I still find that this is a lifestyle, again, for one of a better, that I find meaningful and that those, my friends who are actively participating in it, they're not out there, you know, doing the Oprah Winfrey thing saying, oh, you know, is this meaningful? But yes, they find great, immediate, 
um, meaning in what they're doing. One of the um, largest, well, two, two of the large landscapes that I've done recently, one was Elysium, that's a, that's a large one. It's almost a color field painting of uh, uh, fields in autumn, but uh, it was done in memoriam of a very dear landscape painter, Brian Sweetland, friend of all of ours, who's one of the greatest painters, uh, had, had an accidental early demise. Oh, no. The landscape here can still speak to me as that otherworldly. Uh, it still speaks to me as that beyond just, you know, uh, um, you know I, I, I don't paint parking lots. You know, the land means something to me. And then the largest landscape painting I did last summer that I did many, many studies for, but it was a farm, a friend of mine that, that work it, you know, that is a farm immediately next to the Norman Rockwell house up the road here, that if you see those beautiful black and white films of Norman Rockwell, you know, there's a film from the 50s or so of him walking in the fields above this farm. It, it's actually this, literally this farm, beautiful, beautiful film footage of Rockwell in his home in West Arlington, and he's walking with his dog in the fields above this farm, and the Battenkill River is, borders it on the one side and, and River Road on the other. They're still bringing in hay in bales pretty much by hand, and the title of the painting is The Dignity of Work. And I, and I didn't feel, for, you know, facetious or anything. I mean, to me, you know, I was out there, you know, I still help, you know, one of my, you know, I, I still help a friend who's my age, you know, who I helped his, his father. I still help them bring in hay only because it's what has to be done. You know, somebody's got to pick this stuff up and put it in that wagon and get it to that barn. I'm out there painting his place. I sure as heck better put my paints down and go out and help him out because if I don't do it, he's got to do it. And so, you know, to me, there's nothing nostalgic about this. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> You're out there at the well, a... degrees and you live. <laughs> there's, you know... of, there's nothing nostalgic about it. You know? yeah. But you better do it because if you don't do it, he's got to do it by himself. Yeah, I use that you word know? nostalgia probably too much yeah. or because or, I think what most people think when they think the uh, nostalgia is, is a longing for the past, I think, but, but what you're saying is, and I, and I think a lot of people feel this way is that nostalgia also means I'd rather be there than where I am right now. Does that, does that make sense? Ah, I would rather yeah, be there yeah. than where I am at the moment. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hello. With these, I am there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, that's even better. You know, I mean, I pinch myself. I pinch myself. Yeah. You know, I'm out here. I say, George, you are, because I'm not stupid. Again, we grew up in, you know, Philadelphia. Um, you know, my parents are both, we're both chemical. My dad was a chemical engineer. My mom was a chemist. You know, we grew up in, in a very, I, I think my, my uncle was the Republican candidate for mayor of Philadelphia. You know, we grew up in a very... Uh, involved, sophisticated. My dad was head of research for Roman Haas. So I, I, I'm aware of all that. But I also think that if you're lucky, you get to make a choice. And, you know, most people don't get to make a choice, obviously. Um, but if you're very, very, very fortunate and you're willing to take certain risks, then you can make a choice. And of course, most artists have made that choice. I mean, you know, People aren't forced into becoming painters. Um, most of them have made that choice. And, uh, you know, for you know, a certain number of us, uh, it's worked out. Most of the ones that I know that have sort of made it pinch ourselves. We say, there but for the grace of God. So it's not, there's, no, there, there's no magic carpet. There's no, you know, you, you can't push a button. You can't take a pill. Many, 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 many try who are equally uh, talented, work equally as hard, and just don't get that break. You know, it's, it's certainly 30% luck. I mean, again, Jim McVicker is a perfect example. I mean, no one worked harder than him longer. And, 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 and now he has. And, and, and no one has been truer to the cause of what he, you know, what he saw. You know, and now he's, he's, that's been recognized. Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's a big-hearted man, too. That goes a long way. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. With him, I mean, I, I, again, I've known Jimmy for, you know, 45 years or more, 45 years probably. And with him, everyone, just as an example, not to put Jimmy on a pedestal because not to, but, you know, people recognize, oh, he is honest. And, you know, within the art community, honesty and integrity goes a very long way. And particularly, you know, in this day and age where we're, we seem to have lost our way on so many, you know, so many... Uh, facets of, of 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 where we're going, you know, um, to see it, someone who's both taken the risk to be an artist and remains true and honest to that. What 
what, do, what does that mean to be true and honest? One of the things about painting today, we are so lucky. I think about this a lot. We have six kids. In, in, in my, my, I have five brothers and sisters, and the, four of them were professionally involved in the arts, and two of them were scientists. Wow. And mom and dad were both uh, scientists. And they used, I think it was Einstein that said, they used to quote Einstein, there's very little difference. You know, they put out their hands. And there's very little difference between the arts and the sciences. You know, it's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think at the time they assumed we would all become <laughs> scientists. They didn't realize that four of us would go in basically into the arts. I think, what is it to be true? I think that, I'll tell you, you know, remember we started off before we started recording. I, I, you know, I don't have a lot of jokes. I have two quotes up on my oh, um, yeah, yeah, studio yeah. wall. Yeah, let's share, and, uh, let's share that. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, because um, they were important enough that I, because I have to find my glasses. I only started wearing glasses <laughs> this year, uh, but it's little tiny prints. I feel prints, you. I feel so, you. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I know. Only for for but um, uh, and the one is when you were asking me God, what kind of questions. So this is, I just cut this little section out of the New York Times, and it was, um, I think the nuclear collider had opened, you know, the oh, one yeah, in, in yeah. Belgium, and, uh, and it was one of the incredible geniuses. Let's face it, those guys are geniuses. He was talking about it, and then they were trying to ask him some questions, and, and this is cut out of the New York Times, and so this is, uh, someone who proposes a non-strange answer shows that he didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you ask me these questions, and I give you these wacko answers. And so, at least I'm trying to understand. You know. But that was one. And the other is very beautiful, and this was also cut out of the New York Times. And it's uh, it's from, I don't know what it's from, an editorial, I think, but it's, I, I've loved this. The novelist Albert Camus said it best, and this is obviously a translation from one of his poems. But it says, a man's work is nothing but this slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art those two or three great and simple images in whose presence his heart first opened. I like that, yeah. He said it best. I'll just say that. He said, that's, you say, what is truth? Was There you go. He said it best. I mean, I met Jimmy when he was, you know, I mean, we were both young men and his art was rough and vigorous, but it had so much impact. He stayed true to that. You know, his work is, is beautiful and vigorous yes. now and it still has impact. So that's what I would say is that, you know, Camus says it far better <laughs> than I can, I assure you, you know. Oh, that's delightful um, though. But those uh. are two quotes that I have on my door as I come in the studio. Let's talk nuts and bolts, man. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, Not so, exactly. Because 99.9% of it is nuts and bolts. I really would like to talk about the work of painting. What's your process? Yes. What do you use? Uh, you know, uh, yeah. how, maybe we start with the process and design. How do you, how do you select what you want to paint and how do you approach it? I've, yes. I, I mean, I've painted since I was three years old. So I pretty much painted all my life. I really got involved. Uh, I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate. My sister, who's 13 months older than I am, she's also an artist. She has an MFA and taught at the Alberta College of Art up in uh, Alberta, Canada. And now she lives in Vancouver and she's primarily a ceramicist. But uh, as, a, as a kid, you know, she was drawing all the time. And so I was drawing all the time and I could do it without taking heat. Let's face it, boys, possibly, I don't know, whatever, in school and things like that, and I'm talking third, fourth grade, we were drawing all the time. And she was, I always say her drawings from, even from junior high, remind me of Augustus Johns. She was a remarkable draftsman. We had, you know, we grew, again, suburban Philadelphia, there's museums everywhere. And so we were always at museums, go up to the Met and things. My seventh grade art teacher, again, many of the art teachers from our for our high school and junior high school came from Tyler Art School, which is right in the neighborhood. You know, so they were very, very good. And, uh, you know, they were artists and teachers. She said, you know, she just took me aside. She said, look, it, you got, you know, you're pretty good. You got a lot of talent. You got to quit messing around. And she sent me in, in seventh grade to copying old masters. I just thought, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And so I sort of always done that. And then I think the, the, the sort of the, the worst time came when, you know, you sort of finish up high school and you think, Art schools, I graduated high school in 72, art schools were terrible then. You know, I mean, oh, I, we yeah. would go yeah. down, the, even the Pennsylvania camp, they were terrible. And I was, you know, I, I was a smart kid, you know, I had great grades and all that stuff. And so 
father wanted to go, you know, I wanted to go to a, a good school, and the art schools were terrible, and so I went to Oberlin for a year, and uh, Susie went up to Middlebury, and we said, this is awful. My oldest brother had gone to Columbia, and he had uh, been there in 68 when it was chaos, and his, he, he says he majored in uh, revolution and felonious <laughs> monk. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, you know, it was the same thing. I mean, uh, he actually ended up dropping out, went out to part of the Berkeley Free Speech Movement, and then he went up to uh, Humboldt County. Um, a lot of people went up to Humboldt That's County. That's where Jim and, Victor uh, is, yeah. That's where Jimmy came up from Ontario. And, and Johnny said to me, he came back one time and he said to me, he says, look at, I understand the status quo is not what we want anymore. I've found this crazy place, you know, way out in the sticks. You might want to come out there. Susie and I, we ended up uh, out in, you know, Humboldt County and uh, she went on to become this magnificent scientist. And I said I was middle class enough to finish up a, um, you know, quote unquote art degree at the college there. But mostly we just, just painted. You know, we had our own studios off campus and things. Just paint, 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 paint all the time, every day, all day. And somehow, I, you know, so how do I do things? I mean, I, I, I have tons of materials. You know, one of the things is we had the figure available about 40 hours a week. Yeah, I had spent a great deal of time both drawing and painting the model. And I guess, you know, that goes back to um, when you know, I was telling you about film. Uh, just a, in terms of extraordinary That's right, you were a filmmaker. Yeah, I, I was, it, it, as a junior and senior in high school, there was a film company in uh, Philadelphia, Rick Trump Productions, that was making, and so this would have been 71, 72, it was making uh, educational films, yeah. and they got the idea to, I mean, they were very, very classy. They wanted, they, they were paid by France and paid by England. They wanted to make a film on what, was, it's actually a multimedia experience. We had, we had four 16-millimeter uh, uh, film cameras. Were you we using had, like um, Bolix or Aries or... Yes, yeah. yes, I haven't heard that word forever. Yeah. We had, then we had, we took 500 slides. They were all in carousels and coordinated with a quadra Q programmer and then a live, an act, a live actor who would present it. And uh, one year we went over for 10 weeks and we, we made a, you know, all, we got all the material for what would it be like for a high school kid to basically bomb around France for the summer. And then the next year we said, what would it be like for a high school kid to bomb around England for the summer? And uh, we had a crew of seven and basically I was the actor, the guy. And then I would, during the school year and the other summers and even came back from college, would help with the technical side of it, which, you know, was a, a world for me because these guys were world class. It, it meant that, you know, in, in the junior in senior high school, I got to visit practically not every museum in France, just 5,000 of them, but, you know, 20 or 30 museums throughout France, all throughout England. And I was a painter at that point, and so uh, just an extraordinary opportunity to see all this stuff. Were you shown painting on on camera, on film? No, no, no. I would. I had my sketchbook, my watercolors with me, but mostly I was going and, you know, I spoke French, and so I was going and I was meeting people, you know, meeting farmers, and then we'd go out and, you know, you're a French farmer, and you'd go out in the field and you'd talk about, you know, pigs and, 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 and grapes and things, and then you'd go into the village and you'd, you know, talk about, you'd go to the, 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 the boulangerie and you'd talk about making bread, or you'd go up to the castle and you'd have, you know, a glass of wine with, the, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, that was a period of time in filmmaking where a lot of things were very avant-garde, you know, very experimental. Yes. And, and yes. so, uh, you know, I did those type of things too, where there were multimedia, you're, you're combining film yeah, and it slides. And, it was awesome. Yeah, it, it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was very cool. Yeah. Yeah, with a live actor, I mean, there'd be like, uh, you know, a couple of screens. There were four big yep. screens, and on the two screens on the sides would be the film, and on the uh, screens in the middle would be the eight different slide projectors all just kind of merging into each other and everything, and then the live actor. Were they would, synchronized with something? Or? Yeah, they, were, they had a quadricube. The quadricube, quadricube yeah. Quadricube okay. something or other. Right. Yeah, so they were computer controlled, and then the actor would be out front, you know, uh, uh, talking about things and stuff like that. It was, it was they were <laughs> awesome. That's they were cool. Are these things then, still, um, do they still exist? Uh, you know, I should I I don't know. Do you think the I film mean, itself was, would be a uh, standalone, or would it have to still be presented with the multimedia presentation? I think the, oh, oh, the film would be the films would be standalone definitely. Yeah, okay. You know, I should you know, I you know, I would you know, I was seventeen, sixteen, seventeen. Rick was about thirty five at the time. 
You know, I don't, yeah. you know, life has gone. I don't know. I, I, many times I thought, boy, I should go back and see if I can get a handle on them. Cause it was, it was, <laughs> it was cool. Yeah. I mean, we had a Volkswagen bus. Um, our yeah, well, French of course, I mean, I wouldn't have thought you'd yeah, had anything course. else. <laughs> I know. Our, our, our translator was the gal who taught uh, French at Bryn Mawr, you know, so we had, uh, you know, a couple of, and then, um, you know, for the English England one, you know, we were still using film, and he got apparently the number two or three photographer for Kodak to come uh, be one of the photographers. And just in terms of, I remember this is just a specific because you're a photographer. I remember we were shooting around Buckingham Palace. The guards are there with their cuirasses, their highly polished uh, helmets and uh, breastplates and things. And I remember Rick taking me aside and he sang to me later in the, in the office when we were collating things, saying to me. Look at this guy. What a genius. He took two photographs of the same, you know, sort of guy in his breastplate and shiny helmet. And one of them, everything was totally shiny and bright. And the other, everything was totally subdued and, and kind of like almost it was a gray day. And again, this was back in film and you had to do it all with, you know, your F stops and stuff like that. And just took such delight in Rick. I mean, I didn't know enough about cameras, you know, but in Rick who did taking delight in the genius of this photographer. There's so, there's so many similarities with painting and, and filmmaking and exactly. photography because we work in values. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, film had had a limited dynamic range, so we we would work in values and yes, yeah, that's right. You choose film had a limited dynamic. Yeah. That's precisely what Rick was pointing out. Yes, film had a limited. I mean, yes, the movie cameras were limited, but with his camera, he could create magic. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that was cool. That was very cool. Wow. Yeah. Was it black and white or color? No, this was all color. Yeah. This was all color. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so how do I, one of the things how I make a painting is. Um, oh, yeah, that's I what we were talking uh, about, right? Yeah, I know. I, I know. Forgot. Not a strange <laughs> answer, like I said. Um, but um, I think at this point, Jimmy and I have talked about this yeah. too. You know, I, I've sort of lived in this environment for a long time. And this is one of the things that I like coming back and painting at home as opposed to running out and doing the plein air events. I've, I've looked at this landscape within, you know, a 10 mile, 20 mile radius, you know, for 35 years or 30 years. So I sort of see the images in my mind and then I sort of go out and paint them. I say, oh, this is this light, like yesterday. So I said, oh, this is a perfect day. I know two places that I can go, there and there, and, and they will be perfect for painting here today. I sort of have a whole lot of images, landscape images in my mind, and I will go out to that area, and then, you know, it's not like you know, I'll paint exactly what's in my brain, but I'll say, you know, I think this would be a good, and so I'll, I'll paint that. And then with the figures, one of the follow, I guess, you know, being in Europe, following college, um, because Susie was a French writer, we went over to Paris and, and, and lived in Paris, and uh, she enrolled at the University of Paris, and I was just copying at the Louvre because Copy, having that Copying up, at the Louvre. I, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I felt very strongly uh, that, you know, the history of Western art was predicated on the figure. You know, I had been a credible Renaissance art historian and stuff like that. And my, my older brother, the one who dropped out of Columbia, for what it's worth, his first PhD was in 17th century Italian critical aesthetic theory, which is basically the invention of the Renaissance. Mm. And then his second is in rare books from the University of Chicago. And so essentially Johnny and I, both are, are him, him far more than I now. He translated about a thousand pages of 17th century Italian into English in order to, to complete this, this doctorate. But both of us have this enormous love of, of the Renaissance. And so I, I felt following college, I said, oh, this is all very wonderful and good, but any artist has got to go. And of course, this comes from back, I was talking about Philadelphia and Paris, you know, in the 19th century, has to go to France and basically go to Col de Beaux Arts and copy at the Louvre. And so I went there to go and do that. You know, I basically copied, I don't know how many, a hundred paintings or whatever. Tell us one or two that was most notable in your mind that you took. Oh, I'll tell you, I have two copies of, I mean, just, you know, I was living outside, actually, I was living in Poissy, and I actually had, there was a, an old Louis Dues, Louis the 
Twelfth was born in Poissy, Saint Louis, and he built a monastery there. It was about thirty acres of buildings that had since closed and had been taken over by different governmental things. And so, a very large part of it was Le Batiment de l'Abbé was the artist studios. It was an art. It was like an art center, you know, but just very ca- very casual art center. Ernest Messonnier uh, lived in Poissy because he was Protestant and he was very uncomfortable in Catholic Paris at the time. So he moved out to Poissy and I literally used Ernest Messonnier's studio in Poissy in this abbey wow. while I was, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And then that fantastic painting of Napoleon and the caressers, it's at, it's at the Metropolitan of all, you know, 10,000 guys on horseback, you know, riding oh, yeah, past. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you know, he painted that painting there and, and, and there was about, a, you know, a 30 acre, um, grassland and apparently he would get the guys to come in on their horses and he would have them ride back and forth back and forth in the in the parkland there so that he could study how they painted but so that was always that was kind of cool i mean i would go in and see Messonnier's painting at the Louvre of like the poet in the garret and it would be board for board his studio and the windows he had very elaborate windows and things but i would say there were frequently evenings there that as, as an artist, you could go in at 7.45 in the morning, and it didn't open until 9.30, and on Tuesdays, you could stay late. And I would be there Tuesday evenings, and I would look literally look down the Grand Gallery, 400 meters long, very wide, that kings used to put in fake trees and hunt deer on horseback. I mean, it's that big. I would literally be there, and I'd look down, and other than a guard stationed every 30 meters or so, there wouldn't be a soul in the place. And I just thought I would pinch myself and say, oh my God. I mean, I'm like, I did two copies of the Mona Lisa. You know, you think of the Mona Lisa now. And people, two copies all you can think of the Mona Lisa, yeah. Wow. Two, uh, two copies of the Mona Lisa standing right in front of it, maybe three, four feet away without any glass. Well, yeah, you couldn't do that now. <laughs> no, are you kidding me? You, can't, you couldn't I mean, do that like, at all. <laughs> Bulletproof glass, like, you know, 12 feet out. Uh-huh. And anytime you go there, you know, there's 500,000 people. There. And no. I'm just thinking, holy moly. I mean, you know, I did the Mona Lisa. I walked over. I did, uh, you know, the Madonna of the Rocks, you know, the other yep. great mm-hmm. Da Vinci that's there. I actually gave Eric Rhodes a, a drawing study from the t- Titian endu- uh, entombment that he still cherishes. E- e- everything was, was miraculous. Wow. Everything was miraculous. And again, I, I don't even bother to go back because I know that it's not possible. So, why bother? Here's a funny, here's a hysterical story about Jimmy and I. So my my sister and brother, again, there's six of us. So, you know, my sister's a doctor and her husband's a doctor. And they were in Manhattan. He went to Columbia. And so they were living in Manhattan down in Peter Cooper Village, which is down in 14th Street. And they had finished their medical school. And, and they said for a treat, they were going to go to Europe for a month before they started residencies. And they contacted and said, George, we'd like to come back and stay in our apartment for the month. You know, you can be in New York for months. Like Jimmy and I, I said, Jimmy, I come. He said, you bet. This is great. So we came back. We brought our French Hazel and things. We figured, you know, we're going to you can take the IRT. It's straight up. You can go to the Met and everything. Uh, we're there. And two things happened. One, the uh, transit went on strike. Uh-oh. And two, they let all of the mentally ill out of the state hospitals in the city. Yikes. They said, from now on, we're going to go to like, you know, that, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever they were going to do. But it was at that moment that they said, we're going to close the state hospitals in the city. And so Jimmy and I, you know, we had taken the train up a few times and we were copying pretty much every day. You know, Jimmy did some wonderful, you know, Rembrandt and Franz Halls were the ones we were concentrating on because they were good, strong figure pieces. We, we, we were so nuts that we were once that strike happened we would take our french easels you know they weigh about 110 pounds and we would walk from 14th street all the way up to the med on 96th we'd paint all day and then we'd look at each other and we'd pick them up and we'd walk all the way back (laughs) and it was just like i mean it's like you know 
I don't know, five miles or something, you know, with her. And everybody else is walking, you know, because there's no transit. So the, the, everything's, packed, you know, it's just like, ah. So finally we said, the heck with this. We'll just paint in all the parks down here. Because, you know, downtown, there's all, the, you know, you got Washington Square Park, got Union Park. And, and uh, so go back. well, of course, uh, you know, not to be on PC, but all the wackos. Had <laughs> and, of course, they were all congregating in the parks. And so Jimmy and I were painting. We literally would have to stand back to back and try to paint because guys would come up to us with nine knives and, you know, you know, drug deals and everything. And we oh, were boy. just like, ah, let's get back to California. <laughs> so that was, we still laugh. We didn't come oh. like, thank God we survived, you know, it could have been. <laughs> could have been trouble. So, <laughs> but, so my my question about process is: go to co- uh, go, let's see. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. That's survive. so. Uh, that's survive. it. Survive. <laughs> yeah, you know, our good our good friend Martin Wong, who did not survive, he yeah. he got AIDS. But Martin W O N G Martin Wong, he he was originally from San Francisco. He was about 10 years older than us. And then the um, phenomenal artist uh, went to the, um, where was he? He was at Mills, did graduate work at Mills. But he, he then decided he was going to come back to New York. And he became a superstar. You should check out his work. He's got several pieces in the Met and he's in the Whitney and things. But Martin used to say, painting is not a race. It's like a marathon dance. It's the one who's standing at the end. And he's very, in other words, have a long career. Don't worry about a short term success. Worry about, a, you know, and of course, but Martin didn't listen to his own advice, but anyway, that's another question. But Martin was a very dear friend of all of ours uh, out there in California. And he's worth, worth, looking up. Um, I'll, I'll check yeah, him out. Martin, I'm, I'm not familiar out. with his yeah, work. Check yeah. him out. He'll blow you away. Yeah. He'll blow you away. Yeah. Yeah. So basically it's, you know, I've, I've got my palette, you know, a basic palette like everybody else, you know, I paint on oil primed linen. I've got, you know, good brushes. Um, you know, I'll, I'll either go outside and, and, and I'll, I'll just start the paint or if I'm in the studio, you know, I'll set up a still life. One of the things I like was the still life more and more. I'm trying to deal with space and form and things. Not so much, you know, someone asked me recently why I didn't paint more pretty things in my still life. You know, like, well, why don't you get some really beautiful vase or something like that? And uh, I try to explain it. They're, they're really not about that. They're more about, you know, and I mentioned Mirandi and uh, Emil Carlson and things like that. You know, the still lifes are more just about, you know, space and the form and things. Um, I don't paint a lot of still lifes just because uh, uh, I try to use the winter if I'm indoors. I, I am doing a lot of figurative work. You know, they take a, a, a fair amount of time, but that's the same thing. I'll have the model in. Uh, three or four times a week. I just love the figure, and so I try to paint. You know, they're clothes models, but uh, I just love the figure in the interior room. Um, you know, I could paint that all the time. I'd like to get better at that. I I don't. I haven't done that, so it's wonderful. Yeah. You know, it, it takes it takes time, and there's a you know there's a it, yeah it ta- there's a lot of drawing in it, and and I like to have it be the model in the room itself, and so. You know, I've got a very lovely studio and I can create sort of different environments without it being too big a deal. And, um, you know, and then w- one of the things that's also very nice is uh, I have two or three other artist friends. And during the winter, we will maybe work at my studio or we'll go to another friend's. So they're all close by and, and we, we've made a point of moving around to each other's studio so that it, you get a different environment each time. So that's I like to do a lot of that. And then are you working together when well, you do that? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so how do how really, do you keep from getting distracted? I mean, I I have, I would be afraid. <laughs> oh no! We're, we're first of all we're all professional. Yeah, we we okay. actually laugh about it okay. because um, uh, we we go to a, um. There's a couple. There's well two 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 nights. There's a figure drawing group, and I've actually stopped going to that because uh, they're more social. You know, instead yeah. of being uh, people start talking, and and we actually laugh. Um, here because we'll go, it's three hours, we, you know, we'll work on it for three hours and we'll just sort of turn to each other at the end of it and you know, the model takes a break and all that stuff, but we'll just laugh because we'll say, you could have heard a pin drop the entire time. There, I mean, of course we have some nice music on or something like that, but in other words, we're not we're all professionals. You know, we know that why we're here. We want to, we want to paint the model. We don't chit chat. We don't, it, it maybe it's like, do you, do you have some rags? I've got a rag or, you know, or something, get some medium. But other than that, well, I, I guess that's where I was going with that because I, I would just think how, how do you keep it from being just a social event? Oh, 
it, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's uh, four, three or four friends, you know, we're all professionals and we all know that, you know, and, and actually, and what's lovely is uh, the models we get are all usually like uh, young, uh, well, you know, but peripherally involved with the arts as well, like either musicians or, or young painters, and they get it too. That's probably very important because if you have a model that just kind of doesn't get it, you want to be selective in who's, who comes to the group, but, but we're all here to work. I mean, we can chat later, you yeah, know, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're here to work and, uh, and we, that that's enough of a turn on. We don't, <laughs> we don't <laughs> but, but, but it could also be helpful. Like I, I could see if I was doing it and I'd say, oh, I'm really struggling with this thing right here. Does anybody got an idea? Is, I, I just can't see the, uh, the, the trees for the forest here for, at the moment. Can you? Oh, uh, yeah, no, we don't, uh, we definitely don't, don't, uh, 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 commit to each other's work or, or yeah. talk to each other's okay. work. We definitely don't do that. You know, um, maybe at the end, I mean, you might just, uh, the most you would say is, oh, that's looking good. Yeah. You never say that any, any time, you know. Well, what They're I mean is they, like, if I, if I was struggling with something and, and I was in that situation, I could, I could say, hey, George, come over here if you don't mind. I mean, it, yeah, I, I, I'm struggling yeah. with this one I, little thing right here. What do you think? Yeah, uh, you know. Um, but you're all uh, pros. You probably don't have to, you probably yeah. wouldn't face that. Yeah, It'd be I mean, me that would be facing we, that. We, we're struggling. <laughs> we're working really yeah. hard, and of course, there's always struggle about. But yeah, I would. I, I mean, not to be a jerk, but um, no, I know. I would yeah. say that. Yeah. In other words, while I teach, for example, very, very in next month, I'm teaching a, a portrait and figure workshop, okay. and and that would be there. It will be entirely appropriate. In fact, that's the idea to go and say, okay, this part isn't working. This part, you know, this part, you need to do this, something like that. But here it's a different, it's sure. a different, you know. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah this is all, this it. is yeah. all relatively new to me. So this is, this is yeah. something I haven't explored. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the insight yeah. on that. Are materials, the, t the materials that you paint with, are they important to you today? Or, oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, it, and, and this is another, you know, it, I think, okay, I, I have um, thought about this a lot, and we, I talk about it with friends. You know, when, when we look at great Western painting, okay, you, the Renaissance, say within the last, you know, from 19, from 1840 up, you know, with the, you know, once paintings were outside and things, the manufacturer, the general manufacturer paint, you know, I think... We really look at that um, period from about 1875, 80 up through you know about 1950 or something like that. But even 19 before that, 1930, and I'm pretty convinced. You know, I mean, we talk. You know, you talk about the greats. You got Sargent, Soroya, any number of greats. You know, Zorn, and, and we have really good people painting today. Really, really good people painting today. But we have to look and just think. We're not. I mean, we're not reaching that level. And I. I'm pretty convinced that it takes, it's not just the, the painting. You look at the incredible music, the incredible symphonic um, music. They say that prior to the industrial, the true industrial age of the 20th century, the symphony, the large symphony was the greatest amalgamation of Western, you know, sort of art in terms of technology. And, you know, you have a hundred people playing complicated instruments together. And then even, you know, you think about literature, the great 19th century novels and things. And I am very aware, and I, I believe that uh, as sad as it is, you know, the 20th century with the two world wars, the Great Depression and, you know, the, the uh, flu epidemic, essentially took Western culture off the map. When you think of, of all that was destroyed, you know, all of the architecture, all of the, you know, all of, all of the, you know, possible painters, all the possible musicians. And then you talk, you know, they say, well, you know, post-war was the century for science. And, um, well, it was, it was like a global reset. It, it really was a global reset. And, and I'm really convinced that, that, you know, let's, for all of the problems of the 19th century, for all of uh, everything, everything, but that great music, that great literature, that great painting was the flowering of the entire culture that had been supportive of it for several hundred years. And, and I think that that is gone. The advantages we have are that there are plentiful of art materials available. I mean, we, we can go out. You know, you think they did not have the art materials available. And it's all we pretty have, good. And it's all 
pretty good. Some of it is extremely good. You know, the highest quality paint today is spectacular. So the, the good thing we have is that we have tons of art materials that are pretty good quality. We have, you know, all of the other things that make it easy. You know, we have vehicles that we can throw our stuff in and drive out in two minutes. We're in a beautiful place where you can paint. And we have the very fortunate thing for painters today, as opposed to poets or, you know, even musicians, is that we are a society that appreciates or wants discreet objects of discernible value. That's right? just simply a societal norm now. And so people buy, people want to buy paintings now as opposed to much more so than 100 years ago or something like that. It was, it's a much wider base. Yes, there's, there's thousands of more paintings being produced. You know, there's, there's tons and tons of terrible paintings being produced. But those of us, the, the several probably thousand painters in America who are making decent livings, painting good to very good painting, paintings. There is a, a system that supports us that, that probably did, never existed in America before. And that's just the significant amount of ex, you know, expendable income that people have. And so people, you know, I can sell a painting and I would just be, a, a, you know, a, 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 as can any of my peers, I can sell a painting any day that I want to. My galleries handle it, but if push came to shove, I could simply uh, take a couple of photographs, send them out to, you know, 20 collectors, and, and somebody would say, oh my God, I'll buy that. And so we're very fortunate in that regard. Yeah, the, glo- that, the global that, reach, or even local and regional reach, is so much easier yes. and affordable now. I mean, I, mean, I remember, exactly. you know, I had a, I never was, I wasn't that interested in art back in the uh, 70s when I was a student in high sure. school, but I, I enjoyed yeah. photography and that sort of thing. But but to find out information was very difficult. I had to go to the yeah. library. There was a few very expensive uh, periodicals and that sort of thing. And, and, and so your your reach of information was just, it was abysmal. But today, yeah. you know, like just like with you. So I learned about you through Jim McVicker. What did I do? I typed yeah. in George Van Hook Fine Art. Boom, there you are. Yeah. Now I can see your paintings. Yeah. I can see... It's just so much more accessible to people that that kind yes. of information. I full yes, I agree. and 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 actually that's an incredible joy for us. You know, the, these plenary events have sort of made a difference also in that you know we sort of do travel around and and we you know hook up with our buddies and we paint together and all that stuff. You yeah. know, and that's really cool. And then we do stay together on uh, Facebook. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I don't spend a lot of time electronically, but you know, I do have uh, my art friends on you Facebook. You can connect. That, you yeah. know, like, it's it's really it, that really is cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so that's that's a real plus. How and when it'll actually pay off in great art being made, I don't know. I think, and also because there was that pretty awful, in my opinion, pretty awful period, you know, the 60s, 70s, where the whole idea of basically throw paint at the wall and see if it sticks, and that's great. You know, the, the university college art uh, teaching mafia or whatever it is, you know, just the, the whole thing, you know, that, that sort of, I, I, I think that, that uh, you know, had a real price with it. But I think that those of us who, who, who continued painting, I think the younger artists, the younger painters today, it's very fortunate for them. They, they have access to that wide range of material. And uh, I'm fully expecting the next generation or two to, you know, once again, be pushing, uh, you know, the, the boundaries and doing some of the great, great work again. So yeah. I'm very um, optimistic about that. Yeah. Well, I've seen a, a, so, a number of younger people get interested in doing figurative art. You know, they're interested yeah. in drawing the figure and maybe it was spurned by the, not spurned. Uh, it was, yeah. it was, in, it was influenced yeah. by, <laughs> it was influenced by, you know, what their childhood interests, you know, like the manga yeah. art and things like that, which a lot yeah. of teachers oh, put I down, yeah. but they, yeah. they, they like that. And that led to the development of, of a, uh, a more, uh, an interest in more uh, uh, representational figurative work. Yes. Yes. Yes, and they have, you know, so many people to look to now yeah. that, um, you know, yeah, they don't have to just, you know, not just Clifford Still. You know, you've got all kinds of painters out there. Yeah, cool. George, well, I, I I deeply appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with me here on The Artful Painter. It's just, uh, it's been a delight uh, hearing your, your stories uh, about art making. This is incredible. I really appreciate you doing this. 
Well, it's been a, it's been fun for me, Carl. I mean, again, you know, the introduction to Jimmy was terrific. As soon, you know, that was that was perfect. And um, you know, you're you're developing a real following. So uh, here's to your success and to um, uh, you know, you're bringing these stories, this information, and this whole sort of world of you know, painting to a much wider audience because uh, the more people that do participate and share in it, the better it will be for all of us. So my hat's off to you and thank you for your efforts on our behalf as well. Hey. So thank you. Thanks, George. Hey, we'll see you. Cool, brother. All right. Stay in touch. All right, pal. tell you how much fun it was to talk with and listen to George Van Hook. Wow, I had the feeling that I had only scratched the surface of the things that George knows and the stories he had to tell. But I am grateful for the time he took to speak with me and allowed me to share this conversation with you. I realize it's taken far too long to release another edition of The Artful Painter. This episode was recorded shortly before the world turned upside down. The painful experience of the global pandemic has has certainly taken a toll on all of us, including my wife and I. Uh, Our family was touched by it, and uh, fortunately, things turned out okay, but yet the future is uncertain, and that's the world we live in right now. It's very uncertain at this time. That's why I think it's important to have a a, a reprieve from all this uh, uncertainty, Uh, and, and I hope you have found some inspiration from George's lifelong experience as an artist. It was refreshing and therapeutic for me to go back and listen to him as I finally got to a place where I could edit this episode. I really enjoyed it. So, And I have many more episodes that are coming up that I hope to be able to release on a more regular schedule there. Please visit georgevanhookfineartists.com to find out more about George Van Hook and his beautiful art. Uh, that's on that website. You'll enjoy taking a look at many examples of his artwork there. Of course, I have show notes for this episode where I provide links to that website, uh, links to some of the books that we talked about in this episode. You can find it there. Over the last few weeks, I have gotten some, some feedback. For example, this comment came in on the website itself, the Artful Painter website. Uh, It's from Brent Kember, and he was commenting on Ann Blair Brown. That was the, uh, let's see, episode number 19. He says, I've listened to this episode twice already. So much to absorb and learn. I'll listen a third time, but I'm working my way through the others for the second time as well. There are so many things I've learned with these podcasts. Thank you. Brent, thank you for those kind words. I really appreciate it. And I'm hearing that over and over from many people that they are listening to these episodes, not just once, but several times. That's a credit to the artists who appear on this show. It's nothing I've done, but it's them. It's their knowledge and their experience that they've shared. And and I'm, I'm grateful to all of them for taking the time to record these episodes. Jason Phillips sent me a short note. He said, uh, love the podcast. <laughs> so, thanks and have a super fantastic day. Jason, I appreciate that. And I got this note from B. Harrison. They say, I really enjoy the Skip Whitcomb interview. Do you have notes to the podcast that list the names, books, etc. that are discussed in the podcast? I would love to see the one to this interview I think it would be very helpful on all the interviews, just the keywords. Thank you. Okay, that's good feedback. I do, in fact, publish show notes for each and every episode. So you can find that at uh, carlolson.tv. They're all there. And then you'll see a tab under podcasts. And there you will see the Artful Painter And that's where uh, you'll see the individual episodes. You'll see the artwork that's associated with this episode. You'll see the books and materials and things like that that we mentioned. I I can't capture everything. It's just impossible. So if you want to find the episode featuring Skip Whitcomb, just go to carlolson.tv, click on podcast, and there you'll see an entry for Artful Painter. 
and you can see all the thumbnails there. And if you click on any of those, you will see the show notes for that particular episode. So, for example, I click on Skip Whitcomb, and if you scroll down, scroll down, you will see a segment called Mention in the Show. So I have Skip's website. I have the website for Plein Air Painters of America. I have the book The Ice Finders, How a Poet, a Professor, and a Politician Discover the Ice Age, The Anatomy of Nature. That book is mentioned there. Landscape Painting by Asher B. Durand and Burge Harrison. That one's listed as well. Now, I will mention that all of those links, or most of the links that point to a book or some supplies, a lot of times those will be affiliate links. So I just want to fully disclose that I do earn a very, very small commission on those links when you click on them and make a purchase. So that was was a good question. Uh, I appreciate that. I do love hearing from everyone. So if you want to send me a note, go to my website at carlolson.tv and click the contact tab. Just fill that out and send me your thoughts, comments, questions, whatever. (laughs) I don't mind. Uh, I appreciate the feedback very much. These are certainly strange and stressful times for us all. I hope that in a, in the future, when someone listens to this episode, these comments will have ceased to be relevant. It will be a thing of the past. But I do hope that you and your families remain safe. And for those of you who have lost dear friends and loved ones, may you find comfort and solace. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.